Welcome everybody, Banshee Cup season number two. The round robin phase is slowly coming to an end and now we have Team Dino going up against Team Gia. So let's see what the teams have in store for us today. Now, first and foremost, of course, just a little bit of a recap over the Banshee Cup. We have $2,500 in prize money on the line, all thanks to Psykiv, all thanks to Kevin. Again, he is one of the biggest saviors currently. It, the man has basically done more for Heroes Esports than Blizzard. That's where we are right now. So just to put that out immediately. Uh, one might argue that is a low bar because Blizzard does absolutely nothing for Heroes of the Storm anymore. Uh, except for uh, bait the lemmings on Reddit every now and then by fixing a typo and then everybody's like, Oh my god, they still care about us! But yeah, so Kevin uh, is awesome. He is the one that uh, put the Banshee Cup to life and now we are heading into our second season. We started obviously in the first season already. We had the same amount of prize money. We introduced the bounties as a tool to incentivize players to maybe think outside the box a little bit. Very different than Meta Madness though, because in Meta Madness you're basically forced to go into some weird picks, whereas here in the bounty uh, system that we have for the Banshee Cup, it's fully optional. So we have bounties that the players can go for, and we adjusted the system for season two a little bit. We gathered a lot of data in season number one, where we came up for the, with the idea for the first time, or we implemented the idea for the first time, has been floating around for a while. The way that we changed it for the second season is that now there is a dedicated bounty prize pool. So we have $1,500 that goes straight to the top three within the tournament, just normal tournament shenanigans. And then we have $1,000 that go to a bounty prize pool. And every single time that a team completes a bounty, they get a ticket. And at the end of the season, at the end of the entire tournament, we're looking obviously how many tickets each team has, and then you get a share out of those thousand dollars depending on how many bounties were completed in total and how many of those bounties were completed by you. So that's kind of the concept behind it. I think we're going to get a lot more bounties also when we are moving into the next phase of the tournament. Currently we're still in the round robin phase where the eight teams go up against each other. Afterwards it's a group stage system based on the standings of the round robin and then we're going to, then we're going to go straight into the finals. And just to also, while we're having the first draft unfold in front of us here, to go quickly over how the teams were done, because that comes up every now and then as a question as well. Uh, players could sign up individually for the tournament. We are playing a captain's draft this time to just shake things up a little bit and have different teams, different team compositions. So players could sign up individually with more than 100 players sign up. Those players were then asked to vote for who they want to have as captains. Eight captains were determined and those eight captains then proceeded to draft their team from that player pool. That's how those eight teams came together, and that's why things are shaken up a little bit more. So that's pretty much what's happening right now. Yeah, now our first game, we now have Johanna and Blaze as the opening salvo for Team Gia, as over on the side of Team Dainu, playing with Hyde, by the way. So again, he is playing from the Korean server. We have a couple of uh, Europe. We have obviously a lot of Europeans here, a couple of North Americans, and also one Korean player in here too and everybody that is not natively playing on the European server is obviously playing with a ping disadvantage as well. Just a bit of a side note here, but it's awesome to have them in the tournament. So big shout out to not only the Americans that are playing, but also to Hyde. By now, Mephisto gets banned on the final rotation. Yeah, we need a little bit of damage. Inferno Shrine's our first map. Sylvanas is getting banned as oh so often. The Banshee Queen, the cup was named after. And she gets the ban hammer time and time again. It is sad. It is absolutely sad. The fruit fly gets taken, so they rely on trash wing, and we get also Chromi, the fake dragon making an appearance. I cannot tell you, by the way, how awesome the game was the other day when we had Chromi go up against Deathwing. Real dragon against fake dragon. And Deathwing were just gobbling that little thingy up. It was amazing. Now we get Kerrigan and we get Muradin. The Carrion pick is actually kind of interesting also in the sense that Gia is somebody that has shown his Carrigan a lot. So by you picking Carrigan for yourself now, you also take it away from Gia, which is pretty sweet too. And my F, yeah, she got banned. So Gia might have to deviate away from this, depending on what his initial idea was. They have Chromie, they need a bit more damage. It could be a melee, it could be a range, but either way, they need somebody that packs a bit of a punch. And in this case, it's Genji. So ladies and gentlemen, game number one, we're heading into Inferno Shrines. Team Gia going up against Team Dino. Game number one, Team Dino against Team Gia. And on the left side, in blue, we have the captain of the blue team with Hanzo. Ready for the first game, the Dark Wolf on Murden. 
We got Jaden on Kerrigan, Donazovsky on Rega, and Hyde is playing Leoric once again on the side lane as over towards the right. Team Gia with the man himself on Genji. We got Skook on Joanna, Soaking on Blaze, Cascon on Brightwing, and Sereni is playing Chromie in game number one with Deep Breathing as the level one talent. Oh, and Rega starting things off with Stormcaller here. Okay, interesting. Take a bit of a look at that. But yeah, pretty awesome. Let's see how this is gonna go for the teams. Banshee Cup has been super fun, I gotta say. It was really a blast so far. We are only in the round robin phase, which is arguably the most boring phase because, as you know, just to warm things up a little bit, the teams can get familiarized with each other. The players obviously screwing quite a lot to make sure that they also have the synergy here. Some switched the roles of some of their players, some also changed shot callers. So, yeah, it's pretty cool to just, like, see that happen. But what we're actually talking about, this one of the downsides when you're playing a captain's draft, and I've been highlighting this a bit as well, when we talked about the upsides and the downsides, but one of the downsides is that, of course, right wing, and there's the kill. Fruit fly eliminated. So one of the downsides is simply that, of course, these teams, specifically at the beginning of the tournament, are not as well coordinated as a team of five players that have been playing together for several years now. And we do have that. If you look at normal tournaments that we create where teams sign up as teams, you will see that most of the teams, it's just like four or five core players, and then every now and then they have a sub or they're swapping one player out if somebody is, you know, on vacation or is just taking a break or whatever else it is. But when you're going for a full captain's draft, that needs to be that needs to be synergy that just evolves. So that is a bit of a downside playing a captain's draft. But just as a general rule, because the comment every now and then pops up, people always asking, I actually get the comment on YouTube a lot, it happens on Twitch, and the comment is like, oh, w what level are these players? Always like, you know, with that little hint, it's like, oh my God, like, what are they doing? And these are the best players in the game. There are a couple missing in the tournament, for sure. A couple that haven't signed up, a couple that are not really fans of the captain's draft. But generally speaking, these are the best players that you have in the game. And honestly, it doesn't really matter what rank they are, because there are some of them that just don't play ranked anymore. Ranked is an absolute clown fiesta anyways. And the one thing that people just don't understand, ranked at the end, or ranked at the end of the day has nothing to do with competitive play. Ranked is an uncoordinated shit show, and if you compare it to actual competitive play, it's a totally different world. Competitive play, the margin of error that you can get away with is so much smaller. Sometimes you look at a play and you're like, oh my god, I could have done that better. And the truth is, the chances that you're right on that statement are pretty much zero, because what, you don't, what most people don't get is that the margin of error in a lot of these games are just so much smaller. That doesn't mean that there are not sometimes silly mistakes that happen. Sometimes in the heat of the moment, the bad call is being made, a team ints, a player just moves into a wrong position and dies. All of these things happen, obviously. So that's the thing. But generally speaking, again, we have a lot of open tournaments where all of these people that think that they're all so good and that they can criticize everybody here and think everybody that they see on screen is bad, they could prove them wrong. But interesting enough, nobody ever signs up for these open tournaments. So interesting. But yeah, as I said, doesn't mean that people are not ending. And also, just to put that out there, because there's another question that sometimes pops up. No, this is not the same level as HTC. Heroes of the Storm will never be played again on the same level as HTC. Just not a thing. We don't have professional players anymore. There are no professional players in this game any longer. There are a few professional streamers that also play on a high level, yes. But just by playing, there is nobody any longer that can actually make a living out of this. Whereas, obviously, in the days of HTC, you could easily do that. So people were practicing for six to 10 hours every single day. That's just not the case anymore. So by default, the level of play has uh, declined a bit. But yeah, blow all that out of the way. After a bit of an early game here, where Team Dino was taking the lead, we now have them also with the first Punisher. So it's time to go for fort number one. And they're already starting to do their thing here, moving up towards the top in an attempt to take the fort out. Now, with the first Punisher, you are normally not able to pull it off just because it's just it's just simply not strong enough. But in this case, they were still able to do a little bit of work. So, job well done. They take the wall out. That's already a win in and of itself. And then just the only question that basically remains is, can they maintain that momentum? They're, they're losing height here. 
So that's the unfortunate part around it. So Hyde is lost. He finally lost one of their players as well. But still, pretty significant lead and experience. A bit more than half a level. Early level 10 for them, more or less guaranteed at this point. Rega by down 46 stacks on Storm Call on level 1. Uh, and everybody just like trying to uh, get a bit of momentum. There is sometimes the unfortunate scenario one team falls too far behind in experience and then has to fight every single objective with a balance advantage. I don't really think that we are going to see that here, but time will tell. For now, obviously just a bit of poke happening. Gia in particular is going to be looking uh, for kills against Dainu, against Hanzo. So no brotherly love lost between the two of them. It's just going to be uh, some aggressive action. And with over on the left side, the next Kazura can be taken. We have the level 10 abilities kicking in. Yeah, and that gives us exactly the abilities that you would expect here. We get the Ultralisk, we have Ancestral Healing. No surprises. Bit more of a quest. I mean, honestly, not really. Like on the red team, I don't expect any surprises there either. I suppose the only potential pick, and it's already not happening, could have been Brightwing with Emerald Wind. If you want to go some old-school Genji Brightwing comp with an isolation play, but not really. Yeah, would have been a bit of a wild card pick in the first place, not so not really being a thing here. But yes, with three kills to one now, we're starting to set things up for objective number two slowly. Each team has level 10, so it's going to be a way more even fight on that. And of course, score. Ah, they go again for Hyde and they take him down. Leo ghosting around a little bit, activating his trade. Fully intentional, of course, here. No doubt about that. So yeah, trade activation happening from him. And then in the meantime, all the way towards the top, a little bit of extra damage against the fort. As down at the bottom of the map now, we're also getting a shrine that is activating here in the middle. So shrine number two. And this is going to be a bit of an uh, important one for this game. If the blue team walks away with another objective to maybe get a few kills, and I think they're slowly starting to move a bit further forward. Dino was alone on the camp for a moment, but gets the assistance of Danozovsky with Rega. Well placed arrow during the shrine fight would certainly help them too. But let's see how far they're going with this. So, a bit of a poke happening here against Leo. Yeah. He's already making his way out. Alright, let's get the party started. First few minions go over to Team Gia. Red team is walking away with a tiny lead, at least initially. Can they... Oh, Kerrigan already with a combo here, yeah, nice! Chromi also with a quick timeout, but they're coming in with another arrow. This time from Hanzo, the stuns keep coming, but Bunker is in play. And that saves most of the players on the red team. Dino was a bit low, so was Jaden. Tries for another combo with Kerrigan, but doesn't connect it. And they have pretty much blown everything that they had. Most of the abilities are out. Right wing still with a few blink heals. More stuns are coming in. The drain from Leo. Genji in trouble. But Hyde again drawing the resources and getting punished for it. Seems like Team Gia might actually get the Punisher here too. 33 stacks for them already. So looking good, looking strong here. Carry again. Ah, she cannot get the kill. And now it seems like Muradin is going to fall. The Dark Wolf goes down. The Punisher has already been taken. So yeah, this is looking way, way better now for uh, the team. Job well done for sure. Yeah, really, really nice moves by them. Making sure that they are not falling behind in this game. And actually effectively taking a lead right now. With Kerrigan getting destroyed. Nice blaze with the final hit there. 13 versus 13 talents. Topside 4 has already fallen as Blaze started to uh, to push that one in. But yep, they are doing a pretty spectacular job on this. So nicely done. The attacks, they still keep coming. We have them with the second fort in the middle now about to be destroyed. So what started initially as a pretty okay start for the blue team with an early level 10 ability has now completely flipped and Team Gia has not only taken a one level lead but also destroyed two forts and is just farming high. I mean, at this point, I kind of feel sorry for him. He died four times, and he activated his trade four times already. Outside of him, only Murden and Carrigan have fallen. And with that pressure at the bottom of the map, the red team is now clearly aiming to damage the final outer structure that still remains for Team Dino. So coming in and trying to take this one out, but... Ooh. 
All right, Ancestral, Handel's Arrow also out. The attack is still coming, and they're zipping away once more. Trying to go for Gian. This time they actually get him, so not only does Genji fall, but Chromie gets also slapped around a little bit. But yeah, she was always a little bit on the kinky side, so you have to be careful with her because she really enjoys that a little bit too much. But yeah, what can I say? King. Exactly. Uh -huh. So, little gnome with a bit of a fetish there. Six kills to five, 15 versus 15. That's a pretty good opening for game number one. I like it. Lots of back and forth action between the two teams here. Everybody's just trying to go and get a little bit aggressive with this. But yep, things are looking actually pretty good. Lots of fun here between the two of them as they are really bringing the pain. It's just fight after fight after fight and a continuous back and forth between the two teams. So I'm definitely all here for that. Nicely done so far. And honestly, I have absolutely no idea who's going to take the big lead here. I mean, for now, you can always argue that the red team has an advantage because they took two forts out, and it's true. But this can still be negated with the next objective, which is this time going to spawn down at the bottom of the map. And yeah, let's see how much you can do with it. 16 Talon is ready for both. We have the Rising Storm after Earth Shield. So the Lightning Shield build has continued for Rega. And yep, let's see what else we're now getting here. Especially concerning the second, or oh sorry, the third objective that is going to spawn next. So yeah, what's going to be the next big hit here? Murden and Karakin are already waiting in the wings. And Genji sniffs it out. So, yeah, they wanted to make a bit of a sneaky move there, but not really working. It's obviously a nice thing if you're having such an aggressive CC composition as the blue team. If you at any point can make a move for it, you can really do a whole lot. But in this case, it hasn't really happened. So they weren't able to lay that trap and spring it. We have 35,000 damage for Chromie nearly. 29,000 for Hanzo at this point in time. Six kills to five, both teams nearly even in experience. But yeah, good damage numbers that are already coming out there. And yeah, let's see how much farther they can go. For now, it's just all about the next objective. That's gonna tell us a lot. Because if the red team claims it, then it's going to be a tough match for, uh, yeah, for the team in, uh, in blue, for sure. Arrow misses completely. Arrow just went far and wide from the fight as they are starting to engage here. The attack is coming. X-Strike is coming in. Here's the attack against Jaden. They want Kerrigan. Even Chromie coming in with their old, but look at the Ancestral. Triggering a nice Entomb. Hide with a really good trap here against them. Maze to the face of Chromie. She's down and it's a triple baby. As not only Chromie, but also Johanna and Brightwing get murdered. All three of them gone. Really nice Entomb to set things up here by height and that was great that guarantees them the mortar punisher and at least the fort at the bottom of the map is going to fall the question of course then is how much more can we do with this we're now 13 minutes into the game so you can definitely uh, do some work with uh, this one and uh, see how far this is going to go for them so yeah job well done that was a nice and neat little move that they just executed here and now they're trying to reap their rewards by moving in and taking out the bottom well maybe not the keep and uh, Jojo's gonna be back. I don't. Can they take it? Punisher is still nearly alive. They might be able to take it down. The defenders are finally ready, but they might be ready a bit too late. Arrow! And they go for Blaze, and he gets eliminated. Beautiful kill. Extremely well timed, and so important for them. So they are able to take the keep out. They're even trying to go towards the core at this point, looking to see if they can maybe just uh, maybe finish the game itself. And yeah, so far this might actually work. The shield is already gone. They're starting to do their damage here. And things are looking pretty good for them. I mean, we got 41,000 damage for Chromie. They're poking 80% on the shield. A little bit more damage being done as the Ultralisk is now moving into Genji with the X-Strike. 68% on the core. Leo, still not here, is finally slowly coming in. Ancestral has been used, but they can still poke against the core. And they should, 67%. So yes, the poke is getting ready. Liu is moving in as well, and if they just right-click the shit out of it, they should be able to end this here. Nicely done. Team Dino on the verge of winning game number one, even with Hanzo being lost. This should be game, and there it is. GG, well played.
as Team Dino locks in the W in the best in the first map of the best of three series. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet, so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Game number two, Dragonshire. We have a lead for Team Dino. Pretty decisive choice there on the last map. They won the third objective and then just propelled it forward, slowly, steadily, taking the fort out, going for the keep, realizing they had an opportunity to end the game, and that is exactly what they did, so good on them. Also, quick reminder, these are the bounties. So again, when we're talking about the bounty board, there's a couple of things that are important to note. Most importantly, teams have their own bounty board. So each team can complete these bounties once. If a team completes the Gazlo bounty, like for example, Team Dequaza has done, they cannot complete the same bounty again. They can't just keep farming the same bounty over and over again, but other teams can still do that. Also, as a side note, these bounties are not all, they're not all the same. You have some bounties that are a little bit easier to complete, some bounties are a bit harder to complete, that's by design. It's not really meant to, uh, we're not trying to like, adjust any kind of like value onto a certain bounty. It's all just part of that bounty pool and that is as an incentive enough. The whole idea behind this is to keep it simple, not only for the audience, but also for the players. There was already enough confusion around all of it as is. And if we now come in and we, you know, add too many layers on the bounties and make the system even more complicated, it's not going to help anyone. So it's supposed to be simple, and that's what it is. Players can uh, play around with it a bit, and they will always may have to make that risk-reward calculation whether or not they want to invest into bounties or just not. So that's pretty much, at the end of the day, what's going on there. Just as a little bit of a reminder, so you can check all of that out. Some of them have already been completed, and you always dip then into that bounty pool of a thousand dollars if you complete one. Turanda, Danizovsky has been playing Turanda a couple of times now already for his team, and I have to say that his Turanda, whenever he played her, was fantastic. Now I have my problems with Turanda just simply because she is very squishy and she can be jumped upon very easily, but that also requires a team, of course, to have heroes that can close that gap quickly. Genji would have been one of them. That's one of the reasons why Medivh is being banned here too. If you can get to Turande, she is very, very vulnerable. But if you have a good Turande player, if your team is the one that calls the shots, you can actually do a whole lot with her. And Danazovsky has played a fantastic Turande, so we'll see what they can do here. Map is Dragonshire. Sylvanas is banned out once again, and even Samuro is getting the axe. Soaking loves to play Samoro. He's one of you. Sven is another one, of course, that plays a lot of Samoro whenever he can. And yeah, time will tell what exactly we're going to get now. Soaking is also somebody that loves to play Chen, so we could get some Panda action. I'm still waiting for the. Um, I think in the group stage, it's highly likely that we are going to get attempts at some of the team bounties. The one that I still want to see a bit more is the Alexstrasza and Stitches bounty. I think this one is very likely to happen if we're going into game four, game five, and that map is either Inferno Shrines or Tomb of the Spider Queen. I think then you can really make a play for that. Before, you will have to uh, go for other supports, I suppose. Dino with Sagara, he likes that too. It's that bot lane control that he's looking for. Whereas Hyde with Rexa is going to try and establish the same amount of control up at the top so that they can go for both of the shrines at the same time and lock in the objective. But that's a lot of squishies that they're running here. They're running Tirana, they're running Zagara. Now with Zagara as a pick, keep in mind, there is a chance, small one, but there is a chance that they're going for Nidus. That would be a bounty. Nidus, Zagara is actually a bounty play, so maybe they're going to try and do that. Chen, as predicted, being played now by Team Gia, and they have Tracer, so that's two heroes that Zagara is definitely not going to enjoy going up against at all. Unless, of course, she has a Nidus she can escape into. But yeah, time will tell. For now, we're heading into Dragonshire with a final pick for the blue team. They need a little bit more oomph, a little bit more damage, and the weapon of choice for them is Imperius. Yep, you can bring the damage numbers, he brings the additional stun, they got a lot of CC. And with that, we're heading into game number two, Dragonshire, Team Gia against Team Dino. Dino against Team Gia, blue team with the lead in the best of three series, so they have match point now. We have Dino on Zagara, the Dark Wolf on Garrosh, Jaden on Imperius, 
Hyde on Rexa and Dana Zovsky is playing Toronda. On the right side of the map, Team Gia. We have uh, Soaking playing Chen, Coscon on Malfurion, Sereni on Tracer, Gia on Junkrat, and Skook is playing Diablo. So, Turand against Malfurion. Now, I am not a World of Warcraft lore nerd, but we talked about my own Nexus lore already a few times, and I gotta say when I look at this, Turanda to me, she's just a green-haired Karen, and the fact that apparently at some point she made a decision between Malfurion and Illidan and went for Malfurion just shows me that she that something is clearly wrong with her. If you have the choice between Malfurion and Illidan, I mean, there's only one clear choice. I mean, 100%. So, yeah, I don't believe that for a second. And then she had some problem. Th didn't somebody tell, explain to me that she went for Malfurion first, and then she went to Illidan, and then again Malfurion? She's a bit of a slut, honestly, from what I, I perceive here. So, Tyrande, yeah, I'm not quite sure. But, uh, yeah, she's, she's definitely, definitely a little bit out there. So... Yeah, she's one of the crazy ones. You should stay away from that. So, a bit tempting maybe, but again, you don't really want to... It's too much trouble. Too high maintenance, you don't want any of that. So now Diablo is down. This is the second kill, actually. They took two heroes down already, which is kind of bananas when you think about it. That's exactly the opening that you're looking for if you're trying to aim for a quick 2-0. They get two instant kills right there, and that's a level lead already. That is just rough. So, one level lead, two kills to zero, a bit of map control, earlier camps. Ooh, I'm not sure, boys, but that is definitely not what Team Gia wanted to see happen here. Now, I still believe in the power of Tracer. They, they have two Overwatch heroes, so by definition, they're already stronger. If you go full Overwatch, I mean, this is just basically a sign that you understand how the game is being played. Draft rule number one. More Overwatch, more better. Yeah. Dino is experiencing that at the bottom of the map as he gets attacked, but they go for the Dragonite. One minute and 46 second Dragonite. That's like one of the faster Dragonites that you can possibly get, and that comes thanks to Zagara controlling the bot lane shrine and Rex are holding the one up at the top. So nicely done. Now that Dragonite is obviously not going to do a whole lot, it's pretty weak, but still strong enough to take the wall down a notch. Won't be able to do too much here, but it's not too bad, and Soaking at the top is now also a bit of trouble. If he would have run into another stun here, that could have been the end of him too. Great opening for uh, Team Dino. I mean, fantastic, honestly. This is exactly what they need this late in uh, the round robin, in order to strengthen their position a bit. So yes, two kills to zero, a little bit of a flip there. Now they attempt to play from... Uh, ooh, Diablo! Yeah, if somebody can intercept him... Yeah, he's dead. Yeah, like, look at the minimap, he has no chance. He is not going to be able to escape from this no matter what he does. He can try and waste their time a bit, but that's all that he can do. Nobody's going to help him out here, and it's the end of Dibble's goodbye. And it all started with an ass-kicking from the Dragonite who came in and just punted him across the wall. So, bad news for our man Diablo. But yeah, hey, it is what it is. Soaking also about to escape over here. Alright, and yep, goes for Misha and takes her down too. In the meantime, trying to make a little bit of a play for Jaden. Danazovsky also ready. Dino, yeah, goes for the next camp. Full control for them. Early level 7 and very, very nice initial control for the team. So, let's see how far they can go with this. That team needs to make moves to bring this back. They are now really in uh, the position where they gotta do something. They can't just simply sit tight and watch this happen. They have to make some moves here. So, three kills to zero so far. A little bit of a lead in experience still. Good creep spread from Zagara down at the bottom of the map too. Level 10, of course, is going to tell us then if we have a potential a potential bounty. Dainu could decide to go into Nidus. Now, they can do a lot of stuff with more, and it's always a bit of a panic button for Zagara as well. But if they feel that they can play the global here, then Nidus might be an option. That might be a chance for Team Dainu to lock themselves. Uh, nice. Ticket for the bounty pool. Malfurion. Ah, it's Imperius that falls and Malfurion. Nah, he didn't die. <laughs> he, he dies to Zagara. <laughs> nice. I was just about to say that he walked away with only a sliver of HP. He had that overheal there and was still waiting for the actual HP to come through. But so it's a kill for a kill. So that's the end of him right there.
Malfurion goes down, Imperius died, but he at least, his life was traded. His life was traded for a kill on the other side. So, still the lead in experience, still the lead on the map. And the move towards the top now, with height. Yeah, the heal from Tyrande. That saved the day. And pretty good damage also against Soaking. Danazovska Tyrande, as I said earlier, is really solid. Very, very strong. And they're proving it again right here as they try to go for scope. And can they take Diablo out? Yeah, they can. Devils is gone. Gets body blocked. They hope to follow it up with the second kill against Malfurion, but couldn't quite close the gap. But this is exactly what they needed. Tyrande still being annoying. Zagara with... Oh. Sad. Just sad. Just sad. If there ever was a Nidus moment, it was right here. Especially with how they're dominating the game. But apparently they don't want to take any risks. They want to win this with a 2-0. They don't want to risk losing the map. So they go for Nidus. Yeah, I don't know. I think there's a bit of a wasted opportunity here. I think given the situation they are in, they could have definitely made that move. Talking about making moves. Dragon Knight number two. Six minutes in. Sometimes we get the... Sometimes we don't even have the first Dragonite at that point in time, but now we already have two for them. This one hurts a little bit more, so it's going to be able to do a slightly more damage and uh, go straight in for that fort. Plays around the Dragon's Breath and should be able to take that structure out, especially since now some assistance is coming his way too. Another stun against Diablo as Skog is just getting bullied. That CC chain is way too much for him to handle. Imperius jumps out as well. Nice save attempt by Chen. With the keg only top shelf placed by him. But Diablo is still gone. So, all in all, pretty bad news for Team Gia. Down one map in the best of three series. We have seven kills to one. And things are just not flowing for the team, are they now? They're having some real trouble here and it's not working well for them. More gets used for just a second. They're still trying to make a play somehow, but... Yeah, with the first fort, lo the first fort lost, thankfully for them in the middle, so the fountain plays a role, but not when it comes to controlling the shrines. But if the momentum can be kept up by the blue team, then they're gonna have a very, very unfortunate game here. Yeah, the blue team is trying. Team Dino is attempting to really just maintain the momentum here and keep this up. So, right now, we got 14,000 damage by Chen. Top damage, by the way, for the red team. Which is kind of ridiculous. Nearly the same amount of damage than uh, Zagara has at this point. So, yep, Chen kegs out. Uses his ult. Not really a long cooldown that has to be burned here. But it's kind of funny that Chen is top damage. Now, Tracer is going to take over the reins soon. But still kind of enjoyable. Yeah. Nice attempt to try and take Garrosh out. But not so fast. And Danazovsky is always there. Danazovsky is really there with Tyrande and just healing that up as quickly as he possibly can. Bringing in the numbers. Maybe not quite the same heal numbers as for example Malfurion. But just that on point heal that we're getting from him and the added, uh, the added danger that he brings to any CC comp by using his trade is making a big difference for them now. An absolutely huge difference. So right now with level 13 talents as an advantage, they went for the Siege Giants at the bottom of the map. Locked those in. Obviously Zagara is now also getting stronger and stronger and stronger. The Hydrolyst Transfusion is already in, but it's going to be even more important once, she, yeah, once that she has a level 16. Diablo is not going to like that at all, and he's already having a tough time. Even with the heals from Elfury in here, Diablo just gets focused hard. And yeah, Tyrande and her Hunter's Mark are making this a massive problem. Another fort falls and of course there's some counter pressure at the top that the red team is trying to establish. One of the ideas of setting this up in the first place, this push, was to make sure that they're getting the experience to draw even in XP and get level 13. So that was the game plan here. And they were able to at least get that level, but besides that, things are just not working for them. As you can clearly tell right now. Yeah, they are in in real trouble, huge problems for them, and yeah, it's just tough. So next attack already coming in, trying again with the Riptire, and ah, they want the kill against the Furious, but they can't quite get it. 
So yeah, Imperius at this point is still alive. Zagara is all alone at the bottom of the map. She's not part of this fight at the top. She's still all alone. And the one thing that you should never do in your entire Heroes of the Storm career is leave Zagara alone in the lane. It's not gonna do well for the lane. So yeah, bit unfortunate. Now, uh, with that said and done, Zagara has to back off, but she escorted the minion waves in, she escorted the camp in, and that's all that they need to do here. So, not too bad. Level 16, that gives us now the Corrosive Saliva. So, yeah, Diablo. If you think Diablo already had a tough time, think again, because it's not going to get any better. Jaden is going to take another Dragonite. That's the third one that the team already gets. They had one at the two-minute mark. They had one at the six-minute mark, and now they have one at the ten-minute mark. So, like clockwork, they're locking the objective in, and they go for the final fort that is standing all the way up at the top. So, yep, there it is. Jungrat gets killed, and it's just a disaster for Team Gia. Currently, Team Dino is just crushing it. Nine kills to one. They finally lose a hero, but generally speaking, they're going through Team Gia like hot butter through cheese. Imperius and the Dragonite is gonna be able to take down that fort. The Winions actually with the final few hits, and that means that the outer ring of defense is now completely destroyed on uh, the team on the right side of the map. So nothing that they can do with this. Maul comes out, they're trying to set up another fight, but yeah, this is looking pretty darn good for them. Another, <laughs> another kick for Diablo, as the Dragonite is trying out for the NFL punting teams. Mm -hmm. And let's see, how much more? 11 minutes in, it's really good. But the one thing, it, it is sometimes a little bit tricky in the sense that if you have such a great early game and an early mid game that you are at some point just keep thinking, okay, we are undefeatable. Nobody can do anything here. And then all of a sudden you just get murdered. So they have to be a bit careful with this and have to see what's going on right now. Because now that level 16 is ready, there is still a chance for the team to somehow bring this back and make a move. Maybe not yet. Okay, here's the damage. Diablo in trouble again. And he's down. Diablo is getting farmed over here. Six deaths against him already. Yeah, and they are just continuing trying to do a little bit more damage on all of this. Seeing if they can follow it up with the second kill. Diablo lost his soul stacks and is now on his way back to business. So off we go. A 10 kills to 2 pretty much already tells the tale. And, yep, not too shabby. If TMG really wants to force game number 3, they gotta buckle up and really make a big play now. And they still can! Give them a good team fight. it's 1.5 of a level lead and it is bridgeable. It's not easy, but the problem is that Diablo is just getting melted. He's the one at the front that always receives all the CC. They're just blowing the tanks away. By the way, this is also clearly giving the lie to that statement that some people have, where the, especially wooden plastic players just don't understand that if you focus a tank properly, you can blow them out of the water super quickly. There's like too many plebs out there still that if you are if you're seeing like any kind of like low level plays or screams and uh, there's always like oh my god they're focusing the tank it's like duh yeah they are because that's the guy at the front and if everybody coordinates the damage when they overstep you can punish them hard and that's happening here look at the amount of CC that we have for Team Dino there's literally a stun on every single hero with the exception of Zagara and she brings the damage. So you can play, you can drop Diablo within seconds. There's so much damage. Zagara is farming against him now too. Diablo died seven times already. And that's not because he's a shit player. That's just because he's up against a really tough draft and whenever he just steps, uh, just a meet out there, he's instantly getting punished. So he's a huge problem, but they gotta engage. They can't just simply sit tight the entire game and wait for the opponent to make a mistake. Not with how much of a lead team Dino has. And they are now playing around the camp at the bottom of the map. They go for Dragonite number four. But all of this has to translate into something eventually. So once that they have level 20, they need to start going for keeps. Because if you don't take any keeps down and then your opponent hits 20 as well, all of a sudden your entire advantage that you had previously with extra talents is negated. And then you're running into potential trouble. Comebacks in Heroes of the Storm are not uncommon at all, and they're always possible. On some maps more so than on others, but especially if you don't capitalize on the advantages that you establish for yourself, then you're likely going to get punished in the late game. So now they have more than a two-level lead, 
and they have the chance to take some of the keeps out. And once that the keeps are down, that's of course when things really start to go well for you because catapults are consistently spawning, can attack the core directly. First keep is already destroyed, so now you have an avenue when you are taking the opponent down in a future team fight where you can go for the core. And they're obviously just sniffing around it now too, seeing if they can get a kill here so that they can go for the core directly. But Garrosh falls and that forces them back. That means they won't be able to do anything. Yet. So 12, 2, 3 on the kill account. Diablo again with the engage, trying to force the battle. They know they need to. And they get Zagara. Finally some plays. Danazovsky is also about to die. Tyrande goes down. That's three kills for the red team. So job well done. They're trying for Chen, but Rexa dies. And now it's the end of Jade with Imperius. It's a five-man team wipe. And you look at experience now, and it's nearly even. They're gonna have level 20 here. So, yeah. Only a five kill difference. Experience or levels are the same. Talents are the same in a moment. And there's your comeback attempt. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to work out because they still have a lot of ground to cover before they are actually drawing even with the opponent's team. But that's at least a good start. And they are hoping to take a keep down. 10 seconds until Zagara is back. Yarish is already here. Yeah, they're getting some decent damage in at the bottom keep. Obviously, they have to really expose themselves here to the keep itself. Zagara is now back. Yarish is back, but the keep is going to get destroyed. They should be able to take it down. Oh, they're playing it super safe. They don't want to risk anything. It's mega low, but they haven't been able to take it out yet. And now we have Tyrande back to business. Rex are just spawned. Imperius is going to come in in a moment. So they still hope that they can go and take the keep, but it's not guaranteed anymore. It's insanely close though. But they will have to uh, really expose themselves to potential damage and counter aggression if they want to go deep enough to take it on. So the keep still stands. But this is how quickly this can go. You get one good kill, your opponent retreats, you chase it down one after another, and all of a sudden you have options. And specifically when you're chasing towards their base, and then you get those heroes. That obviously also means that you find yourself in a spot where you're right where you want to be. You're right where you can do the damage. Two structures. So, yeah, that's what they are starting to do now. And we'll see how much they can pull off with this. So as it stands, we have now level 20 on each side. Objective is up. Another Dragon Knight would be very interesting. If the red team gets it, a keep is guaranteed. The one at the bottom of the map. Maybe more than that, because now the Dragonite has, of course, started to really scale into the late game. And they have to be a bit careful, because they don't want to just give this one up. They can try and retake the Shrine at the bottom of the map, but they also don't know if there's maybe a trap set up somewhere. So they have to be careful with that, too. And there it is! They just gave it up! They gave them the DK. Now, there's a lot of good tools against the DK that can be used by the blue team to burn it down super quickly. But the problem that they still have is that while that might be true, the keep at the bottom of the map is so low that just one well-placed Dragon's Breath is going to take it down for sure. So uh, here it is. The keep is gone. Keep is eliminated. Bam, there it is. Dragonite is losing hit points quickly, gets baited in a bit deep, and you can already see how it gets burned down super quickly. I mean, insanely quickly. I don't think there's a chance they can end the game. Even with how strong the Dragonite is at that point in time, shouldn't really be able to go and take the core out. They can damage it, but I doubt they can claim it. I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, honestly, now that they're going for it. With Chen creating some space, is that 70%? They're trying. They're trying. Do they have it? 60%, 50, APOC, Junkrat is down, 40, 30%. They have it. They got it. They actually got it. 50, maybe they don't. They don't! No, they're gonna lose! They're gonna lose! 9% on the core. The entire team gets wiped. And now the move over to the right side of the map to end it all. At this point, you gotta go and end the game. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Diablo is still alive. He's attempting to slow them down, I suppose. Yeah, goes for Zagara and nearly able to kill her. So they're still chasing him a bit. Shouldn't waste too much time with him. So yep, he's gone and now they're going for it.
That's the moment right there. This is the moment where you can make the big play and end the game. 13 seconds for Junkrat, but here's the 2-0 potential, and they should be able to lock that win in. So, job well done. Team Dino is going to win it with a 2-0. Really well executed by them, and they are claiming it. That's victory, a 2-0 for the blue team as they take the W on Dragonshire. Nicely done, defending their core and then crossing the map to end it all. GG. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.